peace and positive energy, everyone. It's Takesha of Native Nubian Wellness, and you are tuning in to another session of Black Women Who Blaze. Uh, today's featured guest is Chef Guidance Moon, um, and I really Hi. am glad that she joined me today um, because, you know, May is definitely, you know, the month for mothers, but it's also... Uh, National Women's Health Care Awareness Month and National Mental Health Awareness Month. And I feel like you have such a compelling story when it comes to Canna Moms. Chef Guidance is also the founder of Ain't No Mommy High Enough. So, you know, <laughs> I, that, we'll, get, we'll get into uh, that some more, as well as what brought her to uh, culinary uh, and cannabis, right? You know, we'll put you to that and you can give us some background about your uh, journey with cannabis and being a mom and how that's impacted uh, your life, you know, in such a profound way, you know. So I appreciate you coming on. She's a medicinal cannabis patient and, you know, she's uh, going to share with us quite a lot about some of the things that she consumes for and how cannabis has helped her. So thank you for joining the platform. Uh, you know, a fellow Black woman who believes I love to find other Black women doing great things in the space, you know, pioneering some things. So please just share your journey, share a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself to the platform and the, and the tribe. Well, thank you so very much, Takija. I'm so happy to be here. Um, right now, I am in sunny Santa Barbara, California, overlooking the beach here. Um, I just got to California last year. I'm actually born and raised in the South. I'm from Louisiana, a tiny little corner in the top of Louisiana. Wow. 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 Okay. Okay. So that's, that's deep. That's a lot right there that you unpack. So in, first of all, you have such a beautiful background right now in backdrop. So I'm, I'm a little envious. It took us a little bit to get on, but you had to find the right spot. And I think you found yes. it. Number two, I'm loving the hair color. Yeah, I'm loving the hair color. That you know, I that I'm a I'm a cosmetologist and skincare specialist uh, by trade as well. And you know that that was my thing. I used to dive into the different colors, so that's a beautiful color um, as well. And I just love it because it's just the skin tone, the sun shining, the beautiful water in the background. You know, super dope, super dope. But you say you're from Louisiana because I can hear it in the accent that it was a southern <laughs> southern girl in there. But you're in Santa Barbara, so how did that uh, journey unfold? How did you get to uh, California, coming from Louisiana, where cannabis is still um, heavily heavily regulated and prohibited? Very much, very much. Well, you know, I started there um, in Louisiana. I became one of the first medical cannabis patients um, about five years ago now. Um, so that was my start. Um, I actually have epilepsy. And so cannabis became a way of managing my seizures. I went from having about 20 surgeries on a weekly basis to about one to two seizures monthly. Um, completely changed my life. I was able to pursue my true passions, which are travel, nature, and food, of course. So uh, I went to culinary school in uh, the capital of Arkansas for about a year. And then um, the universe worked things out where I was invited to become a chef intern at the Ritz Carlton here in Santa Barbara. So I did that all summer while learning about cannabis, advocating for cannabis reform and access and launching my own business. So we decided to stay in California after the internship ended. I mean, how could I leave? I mean, right, right. So that's what got me here. And it's been a crazy journey to be on. And I'm just grateful that it's led me here and connecting with like-minded people like yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, that's definitely some alignment for you. You know what I mean? Like you said, sure. you know, but, you know, you spoke about consuming cannabis for epilepsy. Now, were you a cannabis consumer prior, you know, in your youth or, you know, early on or, you know, you specifically consumed medicinally? So what was that like, your background, since you didn't consume 
you know, when you were young? Oh, I was so scared. I'm not going to lie. Like, I had never used any recreational substance. You know, I'm not even a big drinker. Um, I actually grew up in a very religiously strict household. Uh, I was a Jehovah's Witness for 25 years. Wow. So no cannabis experience, nothing like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so when it was offered to me um, by someone I was working with at the time with my previous company, we were coming back from a company trip and they were passing a blunt around the car and uh, I took a hit, completely got super high. I remember those days, it was a long time ago, but you could take one or two puffs and get <laughs> completely in the clouds. And, um, you know, it felt great. But what I realized after we got home is that I did not have another seizure for probably three to four days mm. after smoking those, those couple puffs. And, you know, that just launched me researching cannabis, you know, and bringing it up to my neurologist, which was a very difficult process, um, in all honesty. And it, this is one of the reasons why I do what I do now is because I know how difficult it is for patients, for patients of color, especially for women, because, you know, we, we appear to be so strong and we are. And a lot of times our pains are just overlooked. You know, I was told that I was having panic attacks until I was around 25 and got the proper diagnosis for my seizures. So, you know, it's been a, a hard journey, but I have been able to navigate the medical marijuana system, you know, in Louisiana, Arkansas, and help other people, you know, get their medical cards and access as well. Mm, mm, beautiful. I mean, that is definitely a beautiful journey, you know, and impactful as well, because to grow up in a an organized religion where, like you said, you know, this type of thing is definitely, you know, uh, uh, spoken against and prohibited. No -no. It's not a, right. It's a big no-no, right? And it's, it's definitely not, not a medicine, that's for sure. Right, right. And there are. to happenstancely consume and realize, like you said, become aware that, hey, I haven't had, you know, a flare up, an episode, a seizure. Like, what is this all about? And it sent you down what you would consider a rabbit hole to a deep dive into, well, what is this plant really about? What is this really going to do? And how can I get access? Because this is for my life. Like, I'm trying to save my life and my health. And my kids. Yes, yes. Because, yes. right, you are a mom. You know, and so we're speaking to, you know, like you said, the health of women, you know, because of all the things that we, uh, all the tasks that we take on, all the roles that we play in, in everyone else's lives, that self-care is right. utterly important and having access to the tools needed, which a lot of people do not understand that cannabis can be a tool for your health and well-being. So you didn't start right. recreational. You specifically started no. for medicinal yeah. purposes. Now, how has that affect your uh, your relationship with, you know, your family and, you know, you as a mom? Well, you know, I, I, I'll be real. You know, I don't sugarcoat. I tell it like it is. I'm out here in Cali right now with just me, my wife, and my kids. You know, I had to basically leave an entire lifestyle and community behind um, when I decided to to be in this industry, to work in the industry, uh, to be a supporter of cannabis, when I made that choice, a lot of people fell off, you know, um, and it's been a couple years in the making for me finally trying to get my family and close friends back home to see the benefits of the plant, the benefits of the work that women like you and I are trying to do out here and doing out here. And, you know, it's, it's slow coming, but I've had so many people from back home who never supported cannabis, who stopped talking to me when I left, and then they jump in my inbox here years later. Hey, you know, my chronic pain is flaring up, and I see you're out here traveling and living your best life and smoking a blunt. You know, I see you going to all these different countries with a joint in your hand, and then at cancer treatment the next day, like, what's going on? Right. And, you know, it, it's just this, you know, and so that part was difficult. I had to really, you know, separate myself from the people who did not want to see the value in what we were doing and who didn't want to become educated. And I told myself, well, I can't really help others and I don't know anything. 
So uh, my wife and I, we started learning. We became cannabis cultivators cer certified. We took courses for that. Um, we joined the food industry together. And now we're both out here in school running a cannabis business. Wow. Wow. Tell us about Ain't No Mommy High Enough, you know, and how that came about. Well, okay, so even though my culinary brand is also my project, I would say that Ain't No Mommy High Enough is my baby. Um, I actually started that right after I first started using cannabis medicinally. Um, I was interviewed on NBC News back in Louisiana for being one of their first patients to have a medical card. And that just kind of um, ignited a, a lot of content. I started traveling, taking my kids to different mountains, state parks and national parks and showing people how cannabis helped me to stay present and active with my children despite my chronic health issues. And it just kind of took off from there. And we've been blessed with close to 4 million views over the last four years. Wow. That's a million people a year looking at cannabis and learning about this plant and how mothers smoke cannabis medicinally are still really great parents and I won't say better <laughs> right right but good we can manage. <laughs> but it, right but right right we're good moms like it, like you said removing that stigma that cannabis consumers, you know moms who consume cannabis are not good moms you know or neglectful moms or you know we're, we're stoned all the time out of our mind you know and stop equating it to you know um, other other substances that do take moms out, you know, of commitment, yeah. things like that. So what are uh, some of the things that you consume cannabis for medicinally? Like, how has it impacted your health? So right now, yesterday, I just left treatment at the uh, cancer center. I have a blood disorder where I don't produce my own red and white blood cells. So wow. oftentimes I'm fatigued, wore out, muscle weakness. And so my favorite thing is smoking a nice sativa like strawberry cough or blue dream. It gives me energy. It helps combat my fatigue. I hiked out here about a half a mile to get to this spot, you know, right after coming out of treatment and physical therapy this morning. Wow. So yes, it, it has literally changed my life from taking pills that made it impossible for me to function to smoking a plant that allows me to travel, hike, cook, and enjoy being a mother. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow, wow. I mean, and, and then you said um, your, your preferred um, consumption would be something that's more energizing, obviously, and, and uplifting and, you know, stimulating as opposed to are, sure. there, are there times that you consume something that's more for relaxing and and sedative for sure you know it, i do have insomnia and also anxiety and my anxiety seems to kick up at night i don't know if it's just me or what but like after the day is done and i've mommed all day and been a student and done all those things you know you start to really think about what's going on and what's happened throughout the day and that's when I'll either pick up a nice indica I really like these uh, Uncle Arnie's drinks they've got with the CBN for sleep any CBN I'm down for <laughs> right 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 and so as a mom what do you you know I don't know how many children how many children do you have I have two boys my oldest is about to be 15 and my youngest is seven no, I'm oh, so wow. sorry. T will get me. He just turned eight a couple weeks ago. <laughs> that, listen, I, I understand. My son just turned twelve, and so it takes a minute to remember. Um, yes. <laughs> but so, what do they think about, um, how, you know, your consumption? How are they feeling about cannabis? You know, I I absolutely love that my children want to know about it, especially my youngest, my my teenager. To be honest. The age that he is, the kids are already talking about cannabis. Some of them consuming cannabis in, in his middle school. He is so educated and he takes a genuine interest in learning about the plant and he takes knowledge to the school and because they all know his mom works at the dispensary and cooks with weed. And so, you know, believe it or not, at 15, he's becoming, you know, an advocate for cannabis himself, you know, educating his classmates like, hey, 
you know, weed is great, but I don't think we should be using it right now, you know, right. and just trying to help kids that do have, you know, cannabis. He's even brought me some products and, you know, that I've looked at that were not safe. No idea how these children are acquiring mm -hmm. cannabis in middle school, but uh, my oldest has definitely become, you know, an advocate in his own right in his school. My seven-year-old, he asks questions all the time, like, okay, mommy, so does the smoke hurt you because it's hot, you know? And I'm like, no, yeah, you know, the smoke is hot, but, you know, right. I explained how combustion works and in inhalation and going into the lungs and your air sacs. And he right. is so smart and they really want to know. And it's so interesting how children are interested in the plant. They're interested in cannabis. They want to smell it and at least learn. And instead of us hiding that info and making it a stigma, I believe that we should share and educate because they're going to go out there and find it. They're going to go get it from other places, you know, and it's okay. I think we lost some reception. We lost guidance moon. Let's see if we can get her back in. Okay, so we had a little bit of technical difficulty, but we are back and Chef Guidance is in a better position for good reception, better reception. And so we'll dive right back into uh, where she was going with um, how she explains cannabis and plant therapeutics to her children. Thank you. So sorry about that. Not as pretty of a view, but you know, at least we have better service out here. <laughs> So yeah, you know, my children have definitely taken an interest in cannabis, you know, and they want to learn about it. They want to know how it works. As I was mentioning, they, they love the smell. Like they know when mom is about to medicate, they smell her flowers, you know. Um, and it's definitely a different experience than I ever had with any of my medications. Like, as a matter of fact, just because I'm in the car now, like my kids never ask me about this. You know, like it's colorful and everything, but this is not something that they are really interested in. You know, they care more about the plant that they see, they actively can see and smell that is changing their mother's life and making her capable of being present with them. You know, I think that plants like cannabis, plants like um, mushrooms and psychedelics, I refer to them, you know, personally, as mother plants, anything that derives from nature and interacts directly with the systems that make us who we are, our endocannabinoid systems, our mood, uh, our, you know, our personalities, I believe that those are like a mother plant. You know, cannabis and our endo endocannabinoid system is there from the start. It's one of the very first, you know, systems that form when we form inside our mother. So, you know, why hide it? Why, you know, deny and choose not to educate your children about the body you gave them, the body that we created, um, and how it interacts with that plant? Right, right. I mean, I think that that's a big uh, part of, you know, stigma, removing stigma is education. That's where it starts. And education really starts in the home and, you know, starts with the moms. They say moms are the first teachers, right? And nurturing, right. We, we nurture them with the plants and things that they need. And, you know, when we speak about cannabis, we're not just talking about the, you know, THC dominant, you know, plant. We're yeah. also speaking of hemp, you know, and, That's you know, right. we're speaking of hemp milk and hemp seeds and hemp oil, you know, and hemp as fiber and things like that. I mean, I used to use hemp uh, fiber for earrings and stuff like that, you know, so making oh. little crafts and, and didn't realize that that was actually cannabis, you know what I mean? Yeah. Until the education was no longer suppressed for us in our community because this is not that's something right. that's new, you know, but it is no. us because we're newly, we're made newly aware because of mm -hmm. prohibition and the suppression of, you know, science-backed um, education. And so how has prohibition affected you specifically? Like, have you been through any, you know, uh, issues with incarceration, you know, since you, you know, because you said you're from Louisiana and yeah. 
you know, has that, have you ever come across any issues with consuming, even though it's medis, you know, you've had it medicinally? Yeah, I mean, thankfully, I've only been incarcerated one time, and that was actually here recently in California, um, mm. in Louisiana. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak on that a little bit more, too. But, you know, in Louisiana, I was very lucky to, you know, never get um, in trouble with the law for my cannabis usage. You know, I'm the type of person, you know, if I need to smoke or I need to, you know, use my medicine wherever I'm at, I have to, you know, especially with the neurological condition. So, you know, is there is a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety that still surrounds me, definitely surrounded me back home when I was in the South. You know, I could never really just, you know, pull out a blunt and, you know, smoke if I needed to. If I was in pain or feeling tired, you know, we'd have to find a little ducked off spot, you know, not to mention trying to find the cannabis itself, you know, was a three to four hour drive usually to get to the nearest dispensary when I was in Louisiana. Wow. So, yeah. So forget trying to use the product, you know, on the way back, you know, sitting in cars are horrible for me with my, um, my nausea. I get very car sick and there will be times where we be leaving the dispensary, you know, three hours away and I would have to use my medicine. To, otherwise I, you know, throw up all over the car and, you know, just terrified that we would get pulled over and go to jail because of the plant medicine I was using. Right, right, right. And, and so even that, you know, anxiety brings on anxiety and that trauma, you know what I mean? That physical, yes. you know, even though now I'm a medicinal patient, the first, you know, you were one of the first medicinal patients in Louisiana. Then, you know, then to have to go source it three to four hours away and then to consume it, you still have to, because what we we're black women in America, let's be clear. Yes. So, you know, that that's number one. You know, we, ha we're not only advocating for the plant, but just for the right to be, you know, and be. Yes. Safe. So it's, it is definitely a lot. Um, but you said you were you you were one you wound up being arrested and incarcerated in California. How did I mean? How did that happen? Isn't it? Isn't it, it was crazy. No use and, and all the things. California. Yes, it is. Cannabis. So it was so interesting because I I thought that they were gonna try to get me for cannabis that night. So I just got off work at the dispensary. Was coming home. Was pulling into my partner's uh, driveway here in Santa Barbara. And literally as I pulled in, an officer pulls me over. So I'm in the driveway, car is parked. And he tells me that my headlight is out, which I knew about that because we had just had the, um, the rainstorms here. And so I drove through a big, huge photo and my light was out. Okay. So as soon as they pulled me over, you know, I had the cannabis I just purchased, receipt sitting right there, thankfully, because, you know, I was prepared, right. um, you know, because he, he said, you know, your car smells like cannabis. I said, it sure does. <laughs> I work there. I cook with it. I use it medicinally, you know, showed him my receipt. And so he was just kind of like, damn, she, you know, she got her shit together, you know, and my badge for work was right there too. And I told him, you know, I was like, I, I'm a chef. So I also have, you know, chef's knives, you know, and lots of cutlery just in case, you know, shit go crazy so right. you know I informed him with that and um, next thing I know sis I'm being told to get out of the car um, I had to call my partner down this was at like 11 45 at night I am a black woman by herself downtown mm -hmm. Santa Barbara there's about seven or eight cops at this point surrounding me in my car mm -hmm. so I call her wake her up you know she comes down and the next thing I know they are handcuffing me and telling me that I'm going to jail for a felony concealed knife charge mm. and I'm like so the the knives that I told you about when you first pulled me over like the knives that I literally showed you and so yeah next thing I know I'm being carted off to jail uh, I spent the night in jail they towed my car all my chef's knives all my horticulture books stuff for school uniforms yeah, I spent the night in a dusty old cell, had on the whole uniform, you know, just completely stripped of who I am as a person, you know, name gone, really? given a number. Right. Hum absolutely humiliating. And, you know, I we spent all night trying to get me bailed out. And the next morning, thank God, thank the universe, I really still don't know what happened and how 
I was able to be rescued from this situation, but um, the one of the cops came in and said, you know, sorry for the inconvenience, you're free to go. We're dropping all the charges. So, right, right, because yeah, was, as was, should right, be. <laughs> there was no crime. There was, there was no crime. And what it was is they still are upholding the stigma. You're a black woman in Santa Barbara driving yeah. around, okay? Listen, let's be clear. Like, this is what I'm saying that the type of anxiety that we have to deal with, you know, just just to be in the space on earth, like, that makes no sense. You had mm. the receipts for your cannabis. You Listen, yeah. medicinally, you consume it. You, you let them know, hey, I'm also, you know, in the industry yeah. and I'm a chef. I have this in the back of my car, like. What difference does it make? Even if you had it in the trunk, you were going to try right. to find a way to inconvenience me, okay? It, it, yes, me. and ruin my life. <laughs> right. You know, technically kidnapping. Let's be clear, you know. And told my car for no reason. My car was parked in the driveway of my place at my partner's house where I was going. And she kept saying, like, there's no need to take her car. We're we're right here. I'm right here. She's you're taking her to jail. So what costing me money. Yeah. Tried to try to usurp some money out of me. That's what it was. You, to, like, it, you know, come on. Come on. But you they know. failed. Thank goodness. You know, I, I I don't know who did it, but I got my car back the next day. Hey, you know, not the next day. I'm so sorry. I wish it was the next day. It took about two weeks to finally get everything together to get my car back out get them to waive the charges for that because it was it was silly like why tow something that was on my property right 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 so you had right so you had to take the time okay yeah. the time to now go get your own your own property back okay definitely two weeks missed out on bookings car. <laughs> right and at the same time right you still have school you still have to do your job you still have your business and all my things are in this car that you have now towed you know, unnecessary. And my kids' things. Yes, 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 yes. So this is what I mean. You know, this is what I mean. And this is the stuff that wears on our mental health, you know. For months. I, I see a cop now and I just completely freak out because it's like, oh my goodness, are they coming? Like you just, I never thought that I would be, you know, in that situation. And I'll, um, as a matter of fact, I do have a clip. I, mean, I can send it to you. I mean, they saw a black girl. I had on a black cannabis hat, black cannabis hoodie, you know, decked out head to toe in, in my cannabis branding. And they just weren't having no part on it. So like you can see me handcuffs and all with my weed hoodie on getting put in the car. I mean, it's it was so traumatic and embarrassing the whole neighborhood caucasian mostly mm -hmm. just looking you know and it's like and now i can't even really go in and out of the neighborhood when i go to my partner's house because i'm always thinking someone that was out there that night is looking at me and wondering like oh my god is she a criminal and it's like mm -hmm. wow they i mean i stick out like a sore thumb obviously right 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 you know as we wind up doing in most spaces where you know there's very few of us and this is why i right. felt like it was important to you know have a platform where we could connect and share these type of stories and experiences for real you know and let people know what's really going on out here how and so how are you finding the industry you know specifically as a black woman in the space how are you finding the industry is it are you finding it equitable is it opportunities for you? You know, are you able to get funding for your business? Like what, you know, give us some insight on how you are faring over there in the West Coast, because I'm over in the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's very different. I will say that it is a challenging and very different environment. Um, so, you know, first just working in the cannabis industry, um, you know, officially working for a dispensary with their whole own like farm, several locations and things like that, that is totally new to me. So uh, um, knowing the regulations and all of the different rules that surround legal weed is, it's, a, it's an undertaking, honestly. And then 
leading a team into that because I am a, in a leadership in the dispensary. So it's taken a lot for me to learn, you know, all those regulations and things to pass down, especially yeah. when there are no black and brown butt tenders or leaders in the dispensaries where I come from. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, the, and see, and, and you'll find yourself really pioneering, you know, that's what we find, you know, you, you being the Have only to. one in the space. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I really definitely appreciate what you're doing. I commend you for stepping out there to do it, you know, and we do this because we love it, you know, let's be yeah, clear. That's right. You know, we love it. And why do we love it? Because we know that it is helpful. It is something yes. that we can tap into to restore our health, you know, to bring some balance into our, um, in our bodies, but also into our communities. You know, this is yes. an opportunity to get back to nature and agricultural science. It's a crop, you know, and, and like yes. you said, pairing it with food, right? Yes. Pairing it with food. Like, I know you say you, you, you definitely, you know, you smoke your blunts, but how, how do you feel about pairing it with food and what type of infusions are like your favorite to do? Oh, well, I love pairing it with soul food. I'm a soul food girl born and raised. You know, I grew up watching my mom and my grandmother in the kitchen, honestly, healing our family through food. You know, my mom's spaghetti could cure any sadness, any depression, her rice crispy treats. With, I mean, just watching these women communicate with each other and create and make each other feel loved and better through food is a big motivation for why I now like to combine that same food and cooking with cannabis because we already know that you know good food warms the soul mm -hmm. and then we're going to also touch on that medicinal by adding in the cannabis so we're going we're going to feel good too <laughs> right 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 we're definitely going to feel good and so right it's like elevated soul food right you know it's it's really giving that that um that good energy you know and that warm feeling when you get some really good you know food for your soul but then find out that it also has the added benefit of something that's yeah. going to help restore and bring balance you know done correctly you know so yes. um so as a leader in the um industry when it comes to the, the dispensary that you work for um you find yourself educating a lot right and so Definitely. what is one of the, the biggest things that you feel across the board should be, you know, one of the number one things that we should be educating uh, retailers and, and uh, dispensary agents or bud tenders about? You know, for me personally, this is just one thing that I found useful and helpful through my medicinal journey. Um, is an encouraging our customers, whether they're doing this medicinal or recreational, using cannabis recreationally or medicinally, to have a journal, you know, or, or putting notes in your phone, something quick, if it, you know, if that's all you can do, and just kind of journaling what each cannabis product that you intake, uh, how it makes you feel, and what terpenes may be in that. Um, I just think that's really, really key, especially. Um, a lot of the people that I've been helping here recently are women and women who struggle with depression, PTSD, anxiety, sexual traumas, uh, self-identity issues, things like that. And they may be on other medications, you know, and they may be trying to supplement with cannabis. So I think that when you first get started with cannabis, it's good to know what you're taking how much of it and how that makes you feel. So then you can customize and tailor that experience later on. New products will constantly be coming out. I love that. Like what you mentioned with, you know, how the industry is treating me. The cannabis industry is constantly changing and evolving. We're learning so much every day, every week, more info is coming out. So to keep ourselves, you know, personally aligned with that growth and new information, I think it's important that we personally keep a journal of our cannabis and that we as cannabis professionals help our clients and family and friends, you know, to keep track of that too. You know, how did this make you feel? Because I've had a lot of people who have some contraindications with like mixing cannabis with antidepressants or diet medicines. Right. I agree. So I think that's important. Yes, yes. You, I, I mean, that. I think that is a very, 
good uh, start, right? You know, especially sure. for a, a consumer or a customer coming in and meeting with a dispensary agent or a bud tender to recommend yeah. that they track. Tracking is important, yes. you know, because if something happens to us, we eat something, our stomach starts to hurt. First thing we're going to think, well, what did I eat? Now you what did I eat? trying yes. to track it down, right? So it, 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 journaling is very important. That's an important tool when you start to consume cannabis products. Yes, yeah. you know. And, and it'll keep you the, from having those negative, you know, the, the biggest deterrent for me and my history with cannabis are other people who have tried cannabis and had a bad experience. And, you know, not just everybody's different, but there's a lot of people who have those bad experiences for other reasons that are not cannabis related. And if you're journaling, well, you know, I did take an antidepressant two hours before I smoked that blunt or had that edible, or, you know, I took that tincture in the morning with my depression medicine versus the other day I took it in the evening. You know, there's just so many things. And just like any other chemical compound, we have to educate and pay attention. Like you don't, when you go to the doctor, are you still on these medications? You know, what's your updated? <laughs> so you have to do that. What's your updated dosage? What products have you been trying? What terpenes have you been putting into your diet and in your consumption lately? So those things are just so crucial for building the right. I want to stress the right relationship with cannabis. Yes, yes. I think that's important, especially for women's health. You know, women. Yes you know, in cannabis. And just could you speak to the importance of women considering cannabis as a natural tool to help them balance all the things in women's health, not just reproductive, but like you said, um, you know, when it comes to skincare, when it comes to yeah. you know, gut health, when it comes to, you know, hormone balancing and all of those type of things. Um, just give us a, a, you know, one thing that you would recommend women you know, do? I'm going to say <laughs> a lot of women that I've talked to, I, I don't want to say that they're unhappy. They're not unhappy. They seem to be missing something, one or two things. They're not having the best sex that they want to have. They're not having, you know, the, the right relationship connections that they want to have. They're not parenting the way they think they should, or they're losing connections with their children and, and spouses and other family members and you know I, I harp on it so much but I I really would like to see women especially women of color considering cannabis as a way to bridge those gaps that are missing because for me personally I have found a cannabis product to enhance so many aspects of my life like you mentioned skincare I absolutely love using you know hemp and CBD lotions and sunscreens there are so many black and brown melanated sisters making products to take care of our skin. Uh, there's a lady that I just was in the Minorities for Medical Marijuana meeting with who is making products to help women through childbirth and breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just we consider all these other things and Herbalife and, and <laughs> you know, all these other methods to bridge these gaps when I think we overlooked sometimes one of the things that was with us from the start, that was a part of the Black community from the very origins of where we come from. Mm -hmm. And I, it's just, it's ingrained in us, but it's been watered down, washed down and, and stigmatized so much that I think it's time for us to, like you and I are doing, re-educate and reintegrate cannabis into the Black community. Right, right, right. I think that that's the, um, that's the way to go, you know, because, you know, we can, we can go and, and, and lobby for federal legalization. We can do all the things, but we know that until we can remove the stigma and stereotype yes. of criminalization, um, of cannabis consume, you know, consumers and, you know, distributors and things like that. And, right. you know, the, the harmful effects of prohibition and the war on drugs, you know, just that whole thing. And like you said, the anxiety of it, of having it yes. police and all the things that prohibition has done to our community until, so we can, until we can 
help educate, you know, them on the history, the real history of it, why that happened and, and really acknowledge that it happened to us and we yeah. re-educated, you know, it's going to still be, even with it being federally legal, even in states that it, it's, it's, um, mm-hmm. legal in the state, in the black communities. It, yes. It's still it's still a no go for for a lot of yep. a lot of our people, you know, especially in organized religion. You spoke oh, about yes. that briefly, you know, and in and I definitely know um, you know, what what you may have experienced, you know, in that that's so sad to me. Because, you know, if if you believe in God, you know, who do you think put it here? <laughs> you know like where did it come from if if you right. believe in a divine creator mm-hmm. right right um right and so <laughs> you know before you go i wanted to ask what is you know for any of the black women that are looking to get involved in the space you know what are maybe two tips that you would give them to start with wanting to get involved in the cannabis industry? You know, what are two things that they should do? Well, um, that's a great question. I'm going to say the, the route that I took first is educate. Educate yourself, you know, research, learn all you can about the plant. There are so many avenues to learn about cannabis out there. There are online courses. There are people like you and me who you can ask questions to. If you live in a, you know, recreationally legal place, go to your nearest dispensary, you know, and ask an educated uh, butt tender, you know, or someone who has used cannabis, definitely. You want to educate, you know, yourself first. And then second, I'm going to make up my own word, I think, here on this one. But second, I would say communitize cannabis. Uh, Take what you learn back to the community. Ask questions of those in the community. Share with the community. If If there are no grassroots cannabis organizations, in your area, make one. Reach out to local cannabis organizations. I think just about every state has a NORM, a N-O-R-M-L organization. Minorities for Medical Marijuana, you asked me earlier, um, you know, about what I needed in the cannabis space, and that organization has, I've been a part of it for about a month now, and have already learned and connected with so many amazing cannabis people that I could ever have thought about. So learn all you can and take that back to the community. Yes, yes. That's that minorities for medical marijuana is definitely a dope organization. Um I for love sure. to get the sister Roz McCarthy up, up here yes. and so she could dive into um what brought her into that path and and how she built this you know wonderful resource for us. Um you know so Hopefully that I could just cry just he- hearing her name like I, I mentioned this to them when I was in Louisiana about three years ago and I first got it started I was hearing names like Roz McCarthy and and organizations like Minorities for Medical Marijuana and just I was seeing all these things and hearing about them but I honestly never thought I'd be a part of it never thought that I'd be interacting with these people and organizations and it's just if you want to be in this industry, by golly, like just go do it. You know, if you have to move somewhere where cannabis is more accepted, you know, that's what I had to do. Like you said, we're here because we want to be, and it's it's just a dream come true. Like I cry sometimes thinking like I went from begging to be seen in the cannabis industry, you know, wanting to just oh my God, like, just put me on, like, just let me hold a jar, you know, like, (laughs) just, just, just yearning to be right here, and knowing that there are Black women, and I've got to say, because I didn't mention it earlier, Black women like you, and one of my managers, uh, her name is Courtney Frazier, I have to give her props, because she put me in the cannabis industry here in California, my first cannabis job, you know, she's a Black woman out here in Santa Barbara, putting yes. other black women on okay that's right that's right that's right because listen we know we we can't do this we're not doing this alone there's mm-hmm. no alone for us we know it's a collective that's just how we're built you know right. we're built from strong women 
you know, aunties and sisters and, and cousins and stuff like that. And so we need each other. We really do. Sure. You know, it's, we don't, we don't need competition. We do need collaboration. We're very far and few between in this space and it's only yes. growing. And we know that this, this industry is being built on the backs of the black communities that were destroyed and the single mothers and moms that had to hold mm. down mm -hmm. because their men were incarcerated, their sons were incarcerated, their dads were incarcerated. So we are the we are the keepers. We are the sacred circle. And and I feel like you need to, you know, that's why I'm calling everybody on. It's it's the platform. Let's get together. Let's do something great. And I'm Amazing. so glad that you found. Um, an organization that you feel, you know, really seen and supported in. I'm so glad it was a sister that that's right opportunity in Santa Barbara, right? Coming from Louisiana, like you said, she I know you could try because it ain't like we making millions of dollars. This is not this is right. not. But we know that this is an opportunity to really change the game and transform mm -hmm. us. And so, you know, when I saw your video on LinkedIn, this is why I reached out, you know, and you spoke to what was going on with, you know, um, you know, you put it out there. And I was like, yo, this is yeah. so real. Like, <laughs> you put it out there when your son ran into your arms and you was going off about how you were being treated. And I said, yeah. listen. Because you, because you're in the cannabis industry, because you consume cannabis, and how you know, you know, the, the judge was trying to not see things in your favor as if you were yes. labeling you a bad mom. So, you know, before you go, do you have anything you want to yeah. share to other moms that may be facing similar situations or feel like they can't even consume the medicine that they, um, they they need, you know, for their yeah. own well being because of fear of um, what will happen with their children? You know, I would say, I don't want to downplay it at all. I don't want to say, you know, just do what you do and everything will work out because I know the reality of that is certain areas and certain people like myself, things arise. And like you mentioned, I'm currently fighting a custody battle um, for my youngest son because the ju judicial system in Louisiana refuses to see the validity of cannabis. Um, the company that I work for in the cannabis industry, the name of that company was mentioned more times than my son's name in the actual custody hearing. And I'm still fighting. He's messaging me every day. You know, he does not want to be in the South. He was out here with me in Cali for about six months living um, the lifestyle, going to LA, seeing the beach, learning about cannabis and food. And um, it's a battle. So he is now separated from me and his older brother and my wife, and we are fighting to get him back. And that was the video that you saw. It's an ongoing battle. And I know that there's, you know, honestly nothing at this moment I can do to win that battle. But what I can do is share my story with others because there are mothers who are, like you said, scared to use cannabis. I'm going to lose my kids. I'm going to, you know, my in-laws, I am going through it all. Just know that a day and a time is coming and is here in some areas where this plant is going to hopefully be legalized. And the more we educate the more we share our story, the more people can see how, like you said, how prohibition is literally breaking families down in the Black community. Like because of the plant, I don't have my child. Something has to be done. And the only thing right now that I know of is reaching out, making sure that we have lawyers who are versed in cannabis. <laughs> that know the law, that know, you know, the laws in that area. And they, I, I've looked, there are virtually no lawyers in the South that will assist with anything in regards to cannabis. They know nothing about it and they're scared. They are terrified to go and advocate for cannabis in the courts. I was told, oh ma'am, as soon as you mentioned to Judge X and X that you are a manager at a dispensary out there in Cali, you might as well forget it. Your son is as good as gone. Mm. And to be honest, that's exactly what happened. It, it just as it was foretold, but don't give up moms, you know, 
keep on fighting the good fight, rally together, tell your story. I mean, enough of us talking, we will eventually be heard. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm telling a very personal and emotional part of my life, you know, involving my child, but this is real. You know, I left the South to get away from just that. And now I do feel like I'm being punished in a way. And so are my children. And we have got to stop that from happening for our mothers. Yes. Yes. I appreciate you being so open, so vulnerable for sharing your, your, your life, you know, for sharing your, your story, <laughs> for sharing your journey, you know, for sharing your beautiful background uh, you know, <laughs> and, and sharing your time, really, you know, during this, this month, you know, which is national women's health care awareness month, mental health yeah. awareness month, and obviously mother's day. And so shout out to all the can of moms like you and myself yes. who are consuming openly and, you know, definitely we need support. This is what, you know, this is the platform to say what you need. And we need support in the legal, yes. like you said, in the legalities of uh, family courts, you know, and, and speaking right. up for the moms who are doing what they need to do for their own self-care and still ability and are able to care for their children, you know? Yes. At the end of the day, like, you know, I... To me, I understand why this is happening because of Louisiana and then, you know, the the the, mm. uh, the other parent living in Louisiana and, you know, having a And different- church. It's a very big yes. church-based thing. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, so I understand why, um, yeah. why this is happening, but they have to have an open mind, you know, and really right. an open heart, okay? Yes. An open heart is needed. And so I appreciate you. I appreciate you for having an open heart. And um, I'd love to have you back and we can dive into some more yeah. of you know, Mommy High Enough and, and some more things um, when it comes to uh, cannabis infusions, because I'm also a high chef. And so yeah. I love to do things like swap recipes, you know, some fun stuff. For sure. Well, yeah, I'll be announcing some things. I definitely want to do more collaborations with women like yourself, business owners and creators like yourself. Um, I, I'm going to have a couple events this weekend. If you're in the Bakersfield, California area, we'll be doing some infused soul food at the Cannabis and Music Festival this weekend. Um, yeah, I mean, isn't Mother's Day like in a week also? Right, right. That right. So this weekend, so that's going to be, is it Saturday, May 6th or yes. May 7th? Yes, May 6th, Saturday the 6th, Bakersfield, California Cannabis and Music Festival. Okay, that's uh, that sounds super dope. going to be popping. Twerk <laughs> contest, a uh, uh, rap battle, all kinds of stuff going on. Wow, wow. Okay, and yeah, Mother's Day is uh, May 14th, the following weekend. And so do you have anything planned, uh, you know, for that weekend or for yourself? Yeah, I'm going to be celebrating with my kids, getting together with some other mothers. We're going to be doing a, a Mamas and Marijuana event. Uh, more details on that to be posted on the Ain't No Mommy High Enough page. And I hope to get a lot of Black stoner moms on that, as well as virtually, because I know a lot of um, my collaborators, uh, collaborators and connections are out of state. So look for that coming, too, so we can connect more. Yes, yes, yes. And so how can everyone find you? Um, do you have a website? or, you know, your social media handles, uh, everything will be in the description as well, but let, let's see sure. how they can reach you. Yeah, so the main branch is Ain't No Mommy High Enough, like the song, Ain't No Mountain, but Mommy High Enough, and that'll kind of take you to Keith Culinary, which is my infused soul food brand, and uh, all of my content is on there. We're going to be doing the Hot Boxing the World Tour, going to dispensaries, different state and national parks, and showing off all the cannabis that we can. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. Great. So thank you again, Chef Guidance. Ooh. You know, peace and love to you, you know, and your family. <laughs> Enjoy your Mother's Day and all the all the things you have planned. and. Uh, if you are a black woman who consumes cannabis, are employed in the cannabis industry, or you are a cannabis entrepreneur in this space and would like to come on and share your story, please reach out to me at Black Woman Who Blades on IG or at Black Hannah Sewers 
on Facebook and um, watch us, you know, like, share and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And you can find uh, the podcast streaming on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, all the places that you, uh, you know, stream your podcast. So thank you everyone for watching, listening. And until next time, peace and love. Thank you so much. Thank you.